Hello everyone. Today we're going to talk about psychological disorders. Psychological disorders is typically one of the most interesting topics in intro to psychology. And um, this is one of the reasons why people really start their careers in psychology. Um, they think about disorders, they want to understand why people do what they do, and they want to understand especially or particularly why people engage in behaviors that seem confusing or different or um, uh, atypical or uncommon. Um, there are entire courses in abnormal psychology and there are doctoral degrees in uh, abnormal psychology or the study of psychological disorders. So we're going to give a brief introduction of psychological disorders and we're going to talk a little bit about how we define something as a disorder. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the diagnostic process, how we go about making a diagnosis or deciding if something is disordered behavior, um, and then what type of category that behavior fits into, etc. Um, we're not going to be talking about treatment in this section. Um, there is a section on treatment, typically in most intro to psych courses, but in this section we're not going to talk about treatment. We're really just going to talk about the diagnostic process, the classification of disorders, and how we go about deciding um, what we would label as a disorder or not. Before we get started, one thing to remember is that being diagnosed with a psychological disorder in some ways is similar to being diagnosed with any disorder, where there should be specific symptoms and specific criteria met to make that diagnosis. We, we try to make it consistent we try to make diagnosis clear and accurate. But in some ways, it's very different to be diagnosed with a psychological disorder than it is to be diagnosed with a physical disorder in some way or in a biological disorder. And the reason why is because there are still stigmas attached to being diagnosed with a psychological disorder. With a medical disorder, uh, typically when you share that information with somebody, if you do, if you are diagnosed with a medical disorder, it elicits empathy from the person. Um, and there's a whole psychology behind what elicits empathy. Um, but it's typically seen as it's as though it's not your fault. This is an affliction. This is something that happened to you. And it's easier to empathize with somebody that something happens to. With psychological disorders, people have the strong misconception that this is your fault, or it implies weakness in some way, or that you could just snap out of it if you want to and you're not, and especially with disorders like um, trauma-related disorders or um, disorders like mood disorders, depression, etc. So when there's a belief that the disorder is your fault, um, it typically elicits much less empathy. Uh, people don't feel bad for you, and they actually blame you for having the disorder. And so with psychological disorders, we have to be very careful with diagnosis, almost extra careful, because there, there are stigmas attached to it. You know, people end up getting ostracized because of disorders or, or becoming outcast um, if they're diagnosed with a psychological disorder. I mean, think about it. Think about what it would feel like if your best friend told you that they had schizophrenia or if your best friend told you that they had... Um, some type of obsessive compulsive condition, right? You kind of, your immediate reaction is not, oh, let me help you with that. Or if they told you they have bipolar disorder, your immediate reaction is not, oh, let me help you with that. Your immediate reaction is to be like, oh, maybe I should hang out with them a little bit less, right? And again, it's stigmatized. It's also stigmatized because it's scary, right? People don't know what to expect. People don't know what to predict. And it's hard for people to be around people who could potentially demonstrate unpredictable behavior. Um, so these are all reasons why we have to be very frugal uh, or careful when we make a diagnosis in psychology. So I want to go through some basic definitions and concepts, um, and then we're going to start getting into disorders as a whole. Um, all right, first, when we say disorder, what are we talking about? In general, a disorder is a disruption of normal physical or mental functions. Um, it could be a disease or an abnormal condition. Okay, so that's the general vague sort of blanket definition, uh, definition of disorder. Psychological disorder is a condition characterized by abnormal thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Um, psychopathology is the study of disorders, including their symptoms, causes, and treatment. So 
We said the word symptom a lot. What's a symptom? Okay, the symptom is a physical or mental feature that can be seen as an indicator of condition or disease. Okay, now, this is where it starts to get a little bit complicated. Symptoms are things that we identify as a possible indicator of a problem. But one symptom is often not enough to make a diagnosis. Typically, not enough to make a diagnosis. When it comes to disordered behavior, sometimes things aren't even clear as to whether or not they're actual symptoms. What I mean is, is that you might see somebody acting in a strange way. And in some contexts, that strange behavior might be normal. And this is an extreme example, but it's one that um, is worth mentioning, right? We all live in New York. In New York, the population of actors, especially theater actors, is very high. Higher probably in New York than it would be in rural Oklahoma, let's say. And you might see somebody talking to themselves. You might see somebody talking to themselves with a strange accent. Now, is it possible that this person is demonstrating psychotic behavior? Yes. Is it also possible that this person is about to audition for a part in a Broadway show where they have to speak with an accent? Yes, that's also possible. So if you see somebody talking to themselves in an unfamiliar accent and they're standing online for an audition, that behavior is not indicative of a disorder. It's not symptomatic. If you see somebody talking to themselves standing in the corner of a subway and, you know, spinning in circles, and it's not likely that they're auditioning for a Broadway show, maybe that behavior that you're seeing is a symptom or is an indicator. It's an extreme example, but I use this example to understand that context can make a difference. And one behavior may or may not necessarily be a symptom. Okay? But a symptom is that one behavior. Uh, the example on the slide is, you know, a cardiovascular disease, right? Uh, a disease um, that's, you know, that can be, so, so we have here a disorder, uh, for example, a disorder resulting from cardiovascular disease is an arrhythmia or irregular heartbeat. An arrhythmia, the arrhythmia, the irregular heartbeat, is not necessarily a disease itself. It's an abnormal heartbeat or a symptom that occurs um, as a result of having cardiovascular disease. But it goes the other way too. You can have an arrhythmia or an abnormal heartbeat that is just an abnormal heartbeat, or you can have an abnormal heartbeat that's caused by something else or that's a part of another condition, okay? So understand that a symptom is a small part, but not the whole, okay? Now, what's a syndrome? I have two different, two different definitions of a syndrome here. First, a term that re refers to disease or disorder that has more than one identifying feature or more than one symptom, okay? So a bunch of symptoms found together. In other words, a syndrome is defined as a collection or a set of symptoms that characterize or suggest a particular disease. Another way of putting it is, is that a syndrome is a cluster of symptoms found together that are not there, that not likely there by chance. I'll say it again. A syndrome is a cluster of symptoms or signs that are found together that are not likely by chance. When we talk about a syndrome, it's a number of symptoms found together. Okay, so a bunch of things happening at the same time that aren't there by accident. The example I use for this always is the same, a cold, right? What are the symptoms of a cold? Runny nose, uh, fever, coughing, sneezing, aches and pains, headache. These are the symptoms of a cold. You can have these symptoms without having a cold. On any given day, you can have a runny nose. On any given day, you could have a headache. On any given day, you might have a fever for whatever reason. And any one of those things, or even two of those things, could be just nothing, right? You have an allergy, or you're dehydrated, or you were exercising too much and you became overheated, right? Any of those things could just be by chance. But if you have all of them together, runny nose, fever, headache, aches and pains, etc., it's unlikely that you don't have a cold. You could have another condition, that's possible. You could have the flu, you, you, you could have some type of infection, etc. But the likely outcome is a cold. And the likely outcome that you have all of these together is that you do have a syndrome. It's unlikely that you're going to have all these together and not have some type of syndrome.
Okay, so I want you to understand sort of that part-whole relationship. Just having a part is not the be-all end-all. And having all of them together leads you to a likely diagnosis, but never 100%. It's never 100%. Not in medicine, not in psychology, right? We, we put these things together, uh, we make, and then we make as informed of a decision as possible. And then we engage in what we call hypothesis testing, where we treat it as though it's this thing that we believe it is. If the treatment works, we assume that we were correct. If the treatment doesn't work, you have to re-examine the hypothesis, treat it slightly differently. Okay? All right. So, disorders. A couple things to understand. First, abnormal behavior or psychological disorders uh, exist along a continuum. Okay? Meaning that unlike medicine, where you can't be a little bit pregnant, you're either pregnant or you're not, with psychology, you can have a mild depression, moderate depression, or severe depression, right? Um, you can have mild, moderate, or severe autism. You know, they, they exist along a continuum. It's not an all or nothing diagnosis, okay? There are a couple of different things to consider when we're deciding if a behavior in and of itself is abnormal. Number one, is it atypical? So how unique is the behavior? Number two, does it violate norms? Is it out of what is typical for the society? Number three, is it maladaptive, meaning does it cause harm in some way? And number four, does it cause personal distress? So whenever you're asking yourself the question of, is this disordered behavior, think in these terms. How atypical, how odd is it? How much does it violate norms? How maladaptive is it? And is it causing personal distress? And these are the questions to ask yourself when you're trying to decide. So for example, if we're looking at eating, and eating is odd or atypical, the person eats large amounts in one sitting, and then they typically you know, don't eat for the rest of the day. How atypical is that? Well, in Western society, the tradition is towards three meals a day, um, so eating one meal a day might be atypical. Okay, is it very atypical though? How much are they eating in one meal? Are they eating an entire birthday cake, you know, four whole chickens, uh, a half a gallon of, of liquid sodas, etc.? Or are they just maybe eating two sandwiches or a foot-long sandwich, um, a thing of potato chips, and then a large drink, right? So how atypical is it? Violation of norms. Um, how much does it go outside of society? Do they only eat at 3 o'clock in the morning? Do they never eat in front of other people? Okay. Um, do they never go out to eat? Do they never eat socially? Does it violate norms? Maladaptive. How much are they eating? Are they eating in amounts that would make them sick or hurt them? Are they fasting for days on end um, for no reason other than uh, to, to feel empty and to feel hungry? Um, are they running on the calorie debt? Are they losing excessive amounts of weight and personal distress? Are they constantly thinking about their eating habits? Are they, you know, obsessing about them? Are they worried about them? Are they excessively preoccupied with caloric intake, etc.? All of these things are important to think about when we're talking about trying to decide if the behavior is disordered. If it doesn't check these boxes, if it doesn't meet this criteria, it's probably not disordered behavior. If it is meeting this criteria, it probably is disordered behavior, but I'm always going to put that caveat on there that says probably. And the reason why I say prob probably is because nothing's set in stone. Nothing is an indisputable fact, per se. Okay? So, how do we, defi how do we decide if something is typically abnormal? We're always going to ask ourselves these three questions. How extreme is the behavior? Is it getting in the way of our ability to function normally? And is it causing serious distress? There are a couple of things to think about with this, right? There are extreme behaviors that, you know, may or may not be abnormal. LeBron James's ability to play basketball is extreme, but I'm not going to call it abnormal, right? Because abnormal implies stigma. Is it getting in the way of our functioning? Is it stopping us from doing our day-to-day -day things? Um, are we washing our hands so often that we end up being late to work? Okay. Um, are we avoiding bridges so much that we've had to quit three perfect jobs because we have to go over a bridge and we can't make it, right? So is it disrupting our functioning? 
serious distress? Is it causing us distress, right? Uh, again, going back to the eating example, um, are, we eat, are we so worried about our caloric intake or so worried about how we look or so worried about our body or our, our appearance that this is all we can think about? Uh, it's getting, it's stopping us from really enjoying life day to day. It's stopping us from really participating in activities or being fully vested in activities, etc. Okay. Is it causing us that? Um, the book for psychologists that we use is called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychological Disorders. Um, basically, this is a list of all of the recognized disorders and it's in its fifth edition. We continue to revise and change this book over time as we identify new disorders, as our understanding of existing disorders changes, um, but we continue to adjust our definition of disorder based on, you know, new information, research, science, etc. A couple of different factors and variables. We're up to the fifth edition, which, as confusing as this is, is actually the seventh version of the, the book. Uh, there was the DSM-1, DSM-2, DSM-3, DSM-3-R, DSM-4, DSM-4-TR, and then the DSM-5, okay? Some disorders have been added in, and some disorders have been removed. For example, homosexuality has been removed a few iterations ago, because um, we're not considering that a psychological disorder. Uh, but things that are added in, gambling disorder has been added in. That's a new condition that we recognize now that we hadn't recognized in the past. Um, uh, internet gaming disorder is something that we're probably going to add in in the future. There's just not enough research about it right now to justify a diagnosis, but it's something that we're, or social media addiction, uh, something that we're, we're basically, you know, studying now and will um, end up probably diagnosing or adding to the next version of the DSM-5 or the DSM, okay? So, <clears throat> a couple of things to remember about the DSM. DSM is diagnostic and it provides statistics. Why does it provide statistics? It provides statistics because if you're looking at making a diagnosis, statistics are important. Understanding what the likelihood of this, of this disorder's presence is becomes very important. You know, if 15% of the population, if, if there are two disorders that look similar, um, and 15% of the population suffers from one of the two disorders and 1% suffers from the other. In order to make the diagnosis, if we were to <clears throat> basically act cautiously and act brutally, we would probably err on the side of statistics. You know, unless we see something different, make the diagnosis that 15% of the population would have versus the diagnosis that 1% of the population would have. Right? So the difference between bipolar disorder and major depressive disorder. 1% of the population suffers from bipolar disorder. 1% of the population suffers from major depressive disorder. Sorry. 1% of the population suffers from bipolar disorder. 15% of the population suffers from major depressive disorder. Excuse me. And if somebody comes in with sad mood, changes in sleep, changes in eating, and we're thinking about making a diagnosis, if we don't have any other information, we only have information about their sad mood, no information about mania, no information about elevated mood or anything else, we would likely make the diagnosis of um, depressive disorder because that's the more likely diagnosis until we find out otherwise. Again, statistics become important when we're making diagnostic decisions. Okay? All right. So let's talk about how the, the DSM is separated or broken up. It's separated into uh, categories of disorders. So if you look, I have a very abbreviated, concise version of this. It's certainly not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. But you can see the categories of disorders in the left column, the basic description of the disorders in that category, and then examples of those disorders in the right column. Okay? Um, so, category, neurodevelopmental disorders. So these are disorders that typically begin in childhood and are considered chronic or long-lasting or lifelong. Okay. Um, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, this is a category. So obviously this includes schizophrenia, but these are disorders where the main symptom is psychosis. Okay. And depressive disorders, main symptom is mood, etc. I'm not going to go through each one of these because you can look at the slide on your own. But understand that when we're making a diagnosis, 
we tend to identify the main symptom first. And then once we've identified that main symptom, we try to, you know, look at other disorders or look at the disorders in that category based on what the main symptom is and then see if the other symptoms that the person's experiencing match, if they match the other disorders in that category. Now, there are a couple of other key points to the diagnostic process in the DSM. One of the other key points is that we're looking at, um, is that we, we look at kind of rule out diagnosis. Meaning that, <laughs> going back to the example of mood disorders, somebody could have all the features of depression with either depressive disorder or bipolar disorder. They could have all the same symptoms of depression. You would rule out depressive disorder in that case, and we'll talk about this more when we get to specific disorders, but you'd rule out depressive disorder if the individual ever experienced manic symptoms. Once they've had a manic or hypomanic episode, you can no longer make the diagnosis of depression. It's just what we call a rule-out diagnosis. You can't have those two disorders at the same time. We call them mutually exclusive, meaning they can't happen together. You either have one or the other, and once you have one, you usually, once you have, excuse me, bipolar disorder, you, you cannot be diagnosed with depressive disorder. It can go the other way. If you've had an experience of depressive disorder, you can be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but again, this is getting kind of into deep water here that we uh, wouldn't necessarily talk about in an intro to psychology class. You can sort of parse that out in your normal psychology class when we go into a lot more depth. Okay, But for the most part, um, there are rule outs in the DSM. There's also rates of comorbidity, meaning different disorders that are similar that might occur at the same time in the DSM, and it identifies those. Again, th the goal of this is to help us make a clear and accurate diagnosis. The DSM is not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. It's trying to improve, um, but it's certainly not perfect. Okay? All right, so we're going to talk about a few different categories of disorders mentioned up here. We're not going to go through all of them. We're going to talk about a few, and we're not going to talk about all of the disorders in any one particular category. Okay, so bear that in mind. This is just an introduction. So first, anxiety disorders, okay? Disorders where the main symptom is anxiety. We're going to talk about a few different anxiety disorders. Um, all right. Generalized anxiety disorder, phobic disorder. Those are the two that we're going to talk about. GAD, or generalized anxiety disorder, uh, are people, the main symptom of anxiety, is, the main symptom of anxiety disorders is anxiety, a worry about kind of anything. Okay, anxiety is different from fear. Fear is where you are afraid or worried about an imminent threat. So if a lion is about to attack you, that's fear. Okay, that's an imminent threat, right? Something that's about to happen, something that's clear and defined. Anxiety might be um, generalized worry about, oh, you know, I might develop uh, heart disease later in life. Or I, you know, I, I worry the, about my grades overall, right? It's a generalized fear of something. Something that's not imminent might be clear, but not necessarily about to happen, right? So worrying about heart disease in the future, <clears throat> that might be anxiety. Uh, worrying that something bad might happen to your children, that might be anxiety. Now, if you were, you know, if your kid's standing on the playground and somebody's about to, you know, do something harmful to your kid, and that's fear, right? Because it's about to happen. Anxiety is more diffuse and vague. Generalized anxiety disorder are people that have significant, is a disorder where the individual suffers from significant symptoms of anxiety that either cause significant distress, affect their ability to function normally, and or are very atypical, okay? And we're always going to ask ourselves those three questions. So they kind of worry constantly about almost anything. It's almost as though they're looking to find a reason to worry about something. They wake up and they sort of search, what was I worried about yesterday? Oh, that thing. Okay, right. Now I'm going to think about this and now I'm going to worry about it. And it's not something they necessarily do on purpose, right? They're not happy to worry. But they have so many strong worries that it really just, it's hard for them to live in a world where they're not worried. It's also hard for them to live with the worry, 
Okay, there's some genetic component to GAD, um, and it seems to have some connection with major depressive disorder, and it also might be contributed to by childhood trauma. Okay, but people with GAD tend to never be able to relax because they're constantly worried about something, and it's very difficult to treat. Okay, all right, different disorder, um, panic disorder. Um, Panic disorder is a disorder in which the individual has recurring panic attacks and fear of future panic attacks. When we say recurring, we mean at least two and a fear of another attack. You know, they're worried about having a, an attack in the future. Okay, that's basically panic disorder. A panic attack is an episode of acute anxiety. The individual might have racing heart, sweaty palms, um, diffuse stomach pain, uh, ringing in the ears, tunnel vision, etc. It lasts anywhere from 5 to 15 minutes. It's extremely unpleasant and sometimes you can sort of predict when a panic attack is about to happen and sometimes you can't. It just kind of comes out of nowhere. People can even have panic attacks in their sleep. So people with panic disorder have recurring panic attacks and a fear of future panic attacks. They need both. Okay. Now, one interesting thing is that we're going to talk about um, phobic disorder. We'll talk about that next, okay? So, actually, let's talk about that now, and then we'll come back to panic disorder, because panic disorder has an interesting component to it when it comes to phobias. Phobia, which is another anxiety disorder, is a disorder where the person has an intense and irrational fear of an object, situation, or event. I'll say it again. A phobic disorder is a disorder where the individual has an intense and irrational fear of an object, situation, or event. And those two words are important, intense and irrational. Irrational meaning the person knows that it's not necessarily harmful, and intense means that it has to be severe. Okay? There are typical categories of phobia, natural environments, so heights, water, uh, etc., lightning, uh, and you can look at the other situation, injury, and animals. But remember, it's intense and irrational. Phobic disorders tend to be highly misdiagnosed. Not being comfortable around bugs, not being comfortable around rodents, not being comfortable in high places is not necessarily a phobia. Okay? It has to be extreme. It has to get in the way of the individual's ability to function normally, and it has to cause significant distress. There's a difference between being in a classroom and seeing a cockroach, which has happened in my classes, unfortunately, too many times. There's a difference between being in a classroom and seeing a cockroach and saying, uh, I don't want to be in the room. Oh, that's disgusting. You know, let me stand on a desk versus hearing that there may be a cockroach in the room and running out of the door. The former, being uncomfortable, is just being uncomfortable. The latter, hearing that there might be a cockroach in the room and running out of the door and having near panic attack symptoms, that is a phobia, okay? Phobia is intense and irrational, okay? You have to know that this thing can't hurt you. And again, you could theoretically have a phobia to anything, okay? It doesn't matter what the thing is. It just has to be irrational. Sorry, I'm in a place where the heating is uh, just turned on and you're going to get some background noise. I apologize. So I'll try to talk a little bit louder to kind of drown that out. Um, I don't have a perfect recording studio here, unfortunately. Okay, so going back to um, panic disorder. One of the things that, that is particular to panic disorder is that individuals with panic disorder tend to experience panic attacks in places where they feel like they're out of control. They feel like they might not be able to escape. They feel like... Um, they feel like the, the, they, they might be trapped in some way, etc. Um, anyway, they, um, the, what can happen with panic disorder is that because people tend to not want to have panic attacks, they might avoid certain situations or places that can contribute to panic attacks. So crowded subways, um, buses, uh, crowded shopping malls, um, casinos, crowded grocery stores right before holidays, things like that. These can contribute to a panic attack. So what can happen is, is that people with panic disorder might start avoiding situations or places that might be crowded, where they might feel like they might not be able to escape. Um, <clears throat> so they might avoid public places. Agoraphobia is a fear of being in a place or situation where escape is difficult or impossible. So 
people with panic disorder can very easily develop agoraphobia. So it's commonly diagnosed together. When you have panic disorder, you always have to look at the possibility that the individual has agoraphobia. Okay? So when we diagnose panic disorder, we always have to ask about agoraphobia. Are you starting to avoid public places? So when we make the diagnosis, we're going to diagnose panic disorder either with or without agoraphobia. Either the person has it or they don't. But it's so commonly found with panic disorder that we always speak to it in the diagnosis of panic disorder. We always speak to agoraphobia. Okay? All right. Switching gears here. We're going to go to um, trauma, relate, trauma and stress-related disorders. PTSD used to be considered an anxiety disorder because one of the key symptoms of PTSD was anxiety. Uh, you know, a fear of something, you know, not necessarily imminent, but a fear of something happening. But because this is so associated with trauma and PTSD usually only comes from some type of trauma, either chronic trauma or acute severe trauma, it's moved into its own category of trauma and stressor related disorders. Basically, PTSD is a disorder that follows events that produce intense horror or helplessness disorders, uh, situations where um, the person feels imminent physical or emotional harm um, or feels danger to themselves or others. And the main symptoms are frequently recalling the traumatic event, which can be intrusive, get in the way they're functioning, uh, avoidance of things that trigger the recall of the event, increased physical arousal, etc. Um, and this can happen uh, in, in after being exposed to a trauma. Okay. Um, this can actually cause a sort of dissociation for the individual where they become sort of dissociated to their environment and their surroundings because they might be in the throes of a flashback. Um, memory could be inhibited. Um, there are a lot of different things that can happen to the individual in response to a traumatic event. Acute stress disorder is a disorder where they're experiencing all these symptoms immediately or shortly following a trauma. Post-traumatic stress disorder experiences all the same symptoms of acute stress disorder. They're all listed below in PTSD, but when they've lasted for a certain period of time. So it's usually after they've lasted for a few months, about six months in general, where we change the diagnosis to post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, It's really just a time difference more than anything else. The symptoms are the same. It's just how long the individual has been experiencing those disorders. Okay? All right. Depressive disorders. We used to call them mood disorders, but we've actually changed the title a little bit to depressive disorders um, to break them up to make diagnosis, diagnosis more easily, more, more easy. There are a number of different depressive disorders. Um, they're all categorized by similar symptoms. Okay, so depressive disorders are a category of disorders where there is chronic disruption in mood and typically sad mood um, that leads to impairment in thinking, behaviors, and overall physical functioning. Okay, again, how atypical is it? How severe is it? Is it causing significant distress? And is it getting in the way of the individual's ability to function normally? Look, we're all sad. We all have moments of sadness, days of sadness. But in order to diagnose somebody with a true depression, major depressive disorder, um, persistent depressive disorder, it's got to meet those criteria. It's got to last for a certain period of time, depending on the disorder. For major depression, two weeks. For persistent depressive disorder, two years. Um, and it's got to be extreme, get in the way of the individual's ability to function normally, and cause significant distress. Okay? A couple of different symptoms of major depressive disorder. It has to affect the individual's uh, eating one way or another. Let me just jump to the next slide here. Um, it has to it affect the individual's sleep one way or another, more or less. It has to cause sad mood. Um, it has The individual needs to experience something called anhedonia, meaning that they don't get pleasure in the things that they used to get pleasure in. They usually have hopelessness, meaning that they don't believe it's going to get any better. Okay, um, And they need all these symptoms occurring together for major depressive disorder for at least two weeks, persistent depressive disorder um, at least two years, 
Um, there might be thoughts of suicide or homicide associated with this, right? It's severe. It's not just sad mood. And it cannot be in response to a traumatic loss in some way. Okay? Sorry again about the loud noises here. Unfortunately, there's not much I could do about it. Okay? But when we talk about depressive disorders, it's severe. Okay? It's not just about being sad because a relationship ended recently. It's about such extreme sadness that your, your functioning, your overall functioning changes for a prolonged period of time that might be, you know, that's not really explained by, you know, the trauma. It's not really explained by, you know, something else. Okay? All right. Where do depressive disorders come from? It could be biological. Uh, it could be a function of your thought process overall. Um, it could be because of, you know, major life events. Um, there are a number of different reasons why an individual might experience a depressive disorder. Okay? I'm not going to go through all of them. You can kind of take a look at the slide. Um, you know, this is not a cause, this is not a course in sort of etiologies. It's just a cause in basic understanding of what the, um, of, of diagnostic criteria for disorders. Okay? All right. Bipolar and related disorders. This is a change in the DSM-5. Um, in the DSM-4TR, the previous one, we used to consider all mood disorders together. So bipolar was a mood disorder at that point. Um, depression was a mood disorder, so it was all together. In the DSM-5, we consider bipolar disorder uh, and other related disorders that are similar to bipolar disorder, maybe slightly more mild symptoms, maybe lasting for a shorter period of time. We consider those disorders bipolar and related disorders, and we've moved depressive disorders into their own category. Again, just for the clarity of diagnosis more than anything else. So when we're making the diagnosis, it's easier to make that diagnosis. If you're calling everything a mood disorder, it's a lot harder to figure out which mood disorder the person has. If you break it into categories of depressive disorder versus bipolar and related disorders, making the diagnosis is more clear for the, for the clinician, and it's also more clear for the client, the person who's suffering with the disorder, because it's easier to understand. Saying that you have a depressive disorder is a lot easier to understand than saying you have a mood disorder when the person is sitting there and experiencing, let's say, manic episodes or related mood, etc. Okay, so bipolar disorder. The main symptom of bipolar, di bipolar disorders and related disorders is either a manic episode or a hypomanic episode. Okay, and you can see the basic description of manic episodes here on the slide. Okay, elevated or expansive mood, loud uh, and rapid speak, um, poor judgment, um, grandiosity, delusions. They could be, they could have very high energy. They don't need much sleep. They might be dressing inappropriately. They might be jumping from one idea to another, um, etc. Okay, and these are the basic symptoms of mania. They have to be found together, can't be caused by drugs or alcohol, and they have to last for a certain period of time. So with all of the bipolar disorders, the individual is going to experience either hypomania or mania. And the difference between hypomania and mania really is that one is more mild than the other. In a true manic episode, the person is typically, you know, very deluded, kind of out of touch with reality. They might not remember the manic episode after they're out of it. Um, in a hypomanic episode, they experience these symptoms on a much more mild level. Okay? Um, you can see the age of onset in the slides again for the purposes of this course. It's not that important, but it's just kind of there for, for informational purposes and understanding. Now, people with bipolar and related disorders. If you have bipolar disorder, you typically have a full manic episode and you have a full-blown depressive episode. And you cycle through those again and again, sometimes very quickly, sometimes over months or even years. With bipolar 2, which is a disorder where there's a hypomanic episode, the individual may or may not have a true depressive episode. They have a more mild manic episode, and they might go back to baseline. They might have symptoms of depression, etc. But the manic episode is more mild overall. It's not as severe. Okay. Again, not worth understanding or parsing out the difference in this course. But just understand that there are. You can have a bipolar or related disorder without full-blown mania. We talked about this before. Once you have a manic episode you can no longer be diagnosed with a mood disorder. 
you are now always going to be diagnosed in the category of bipolar and related disorders, assuming that that manic episode is not the function of drug or alcohol use. Again, this is a lot of information, I know. Um, it's a big topic, but just understand the basics. Understand what's on the slide in front of you. Understand kind of the big picture stuff, right? If you're having a manic episode, or if you've had manic or multiple manic episodes, you're talking about making a diagnosis of um, bipolar and or related disorders, okay? All right. Obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders, these also used to be broken up into different categories. Uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, used to be considered an anxiety disorder. Um, it's no longer uh, an anxiety disorder. Um, it's a disorder where anxiety, and I apologize for what the slide says, um, I'm actually going to erase anxiety right now in front of you. Um, it's a disorder in which the person feels trapped in repetitive and persistent thoughts. Um, again, it's a compulsive disorder, okay? Uh, it's no longer considered an anxiety disorder because it goes beyond just anxiety. There's a behavioral component to it. Um, we've also categorized this or coupled this with um, other other disorders uh, where there's compulsive behavior, uh, tic disorder, um, trichotillomania. Again, you don't need to know these, but um, we've put them all together where there's, a, where there's the compulsive component, okay? Obsessive compulsive disorder has two different symptoms. Symptom number one is obsessive, the repeated and intrusive thoughts, thinking about something again and again. The compulsion is the need to act, okay? The the, the the compulsion or being compelled to do something to reduce the thoughts or in response to the thoughts. So let's say a person has OCD and they believe that they're contaminated by something, dirty or whatever. So they'll have these thoughts, my hands are dirty, I have to wash them, I have to wash them, my hands are dirty, they're not clean, I don't want to touch anything, I'm going to get sick. So they wash their hands and they wash their hands vigorously. Okay, The thoughts are the the, the obsessions are the thinking that your hands are dirty, and the compulsions are the hand washing, the excessive hand washing. And they'll engage in these compulsive behaviors again and again. The problem with obsessive compulsive disorder, aside from the fact that the thoughts are intrusive and they get in the way of the, and they get in the way of the individual's everyday cognitions, is that the compulsions tend to be self-reinforcing. Um, if you have studied learning theory at all, um, there's the process of negative reinforcement where reduction of something unpleasant leads to an increase in the behavior. So when the person washes their hands, the anxiety or the obsessions about dirt tend to, um, tend to get reduced. So they're more likely to wash their hands in the future. They're reinforcing this, um, these, thoughts about these, these thoughts about contamination or re reinforcing these behaviors that lead to a reduction in contamination. Excuse me. So because of that, the person tends to wash, and they tend to wash more and more. The washing behavior tends to increase over time because every time they wash, it leads to a reduction in anxiety. The second that they're done washing, the anxiety spikes. Once the anxiety spikes, they have to wash again, and it gets worse and worse and worse over time. Okay, so it's this vicious cycle. Okay, all right. Schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders, okay? Psychosis. Psychosis is loosely defined as being out of touch with reality. It's not the best definition in the world because it's a very sort of mild definition um, for something that can be very severe, severe. okay? <sighs> Schizophrenia is a disorder where the individual is experiencing chronic symptoms of psychosis without a mood component. And again, I talk about a lot of this stuff. I'm throwing this in there. Um, it's stuff that you don't necessarily need to know for purposes of this course. Um, but bipolar disorder can include a psychotic feature, but it's not considered a psychotic disorder in the sense because there's a mood component in there. Again, I'm talking a lot about a lot of different things. I don't mean to be confusing. So just understand that schizophrenia is a, a, a disorder where the individual experiences chronic psychosis, meaning lasting for a long period of time. So we're talking about minimum six months, um, where the individual is experiencing 
symptoms of psychosis, being out of touch with reality, and not experiencing significant mood symptoms. Okay, once you experience significant mood symptoms, you're talking about another disorder. So, what are some psychotic symptoms? Okay, we have positive and negative psychotic symptoms and then disorganized psychotic symptoms. Positive doesn't mean good, negative doesn't mean bad. Positive means that symptoms are present when they shouldn't be. Negative means the absence of normal functioning where there should be normal functioning there. Hallucinations are a sensory experience where they're experiencing something that's not actually there. Seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, or smelling something that doesn't exist. Delusions are strongly held false beliefs. Um, believing that there are a network of people who are following you everywhere that you go uh, at work, at, you know, when you go to the park, when you travel, this entire network is, string, is strung together to follow you and keep tabs on you. Um, the thought police, let's say. Strongly held false belief. Okay, that's an example of a delusion. Um, negative symptoms, the absence of normal cognition, people that don't experience a normal range of emotions, uh, people that are missing, uh, missing words or missing speech or, or have what we call poverty of speech, etc. These are negative symptoms of psychosis. Disorganized symptoms, again, where the person, where the person is displaying disorganization of speech or acting in ways that are inappropriate or abnormal. Um, or the person is not responsive at all, as in the case with catatonia. Okay, schizophrenia is rare, affects about 1% of the population, and the age of onset is typically in the early to mid 20s. Okay, there are a number of different causes of schizophrenia, and again, I'm not going to go through all of the different causes of schizophrenia because it's just too much to know and it's outside the scope of this lecture and it's outside the scope of this course per se. Okay, um, you can take a look at the slide just for informational purposes, but um, as far as this goes, that's all you need to know about it. Okay, <sighs> lastly, personality disorders, and I take a breath because it's a lot to take in. Personality disorders tend to be some of the more harder to diagnose conditions in psychology. With a personality disorder, the individual um, is experiencing sort of a, a pervasive pattern um, of disruptive behaviors or interactions that get in the way of the individual's ability to function normally. It's not, and, and if we look, you can kind of take a look at the definition here, it's a little bit more clear. Um, so an enduring and inflexible pattern uh, uh, of long duration leading to significant distress or impairment and is not due to use of substances or other medical conditions. Okay, so that's what we're talking about really when we're talking about personality disorders. Now what makes it hard to diagnose is number one, it has to last a very long time. And if you're talking about enduring, how do you decide the length of time that it lasts? Is it six months, a year, two years, five years, ten years? It's hard to say, but it's very difficult to diagnose a personality disorder when you meet somebody one time. You're talking about really needing a longer exposure to this person and getting a large sample of behavior. Second thing with personality disorders is, is that they're typically not psychotic. They're typically not experiencing significant mood symptoms with regard to depression uh, or manic symptoms with regard to bipolar. They're not experiencing those things, which means that the symptoms overall tend to be more mild. And it's hard to say when you're diagnosing somebody with a personality disorder, if they're just somebody who might be um, a little bit different, uh, maybe somebody who might be eccentric is, is one of the words that we use, or are they actually experiencing a disorder of personality? So the question you always ask yourself with the three questions is, are these patterns um, causing significant distress? Are they extreme? Are they getting in the way of the individual's ability to function normally? Okay, so there are a number of different personality disorders, and we group them by cluster. And the clusters are disorders, personality disorders, that have some similar features. Each personality disorder is going to have its own main underlying symptom that influences all of the person's interactions and behaviors.
Paranoid personality disorder is extreme mistrust of other people. So everything that they do is because they believe that people are out to get them in some way. It's not psychotic. It's not that they believe that people are tapping their phones. And again, there's a network of people following them trying to do this, but they have the general belief that people are out there to hurt them in some way. People are out there to take advantage of them, to manipulate them, etc. So they're really very guarded and they might even be somewhat reclusive. Schizoid personality disorder are people who really have no interest in social relationships whatsoever. Um, they might have limited expressions of emotions. They tend to be very reclusive. They really just have no interest or desire for social relationships. Schizotypal personality disorder is almost like a subclinical form of schizophrenia. The person has odd beliefs, which might not necessarily meet criteria for delusions and shouldn't meet criteria for delusions, but may be close to it. Um, the person has odd thinking and speech. Again, not totally disorganized speech, but certainly odd. Suspiciousness or paranoia, which can go very, which can go along with schizophrenia. But again, they're not at the level of schizophrenia. It's sort of like this baby schizophrenia. Okay. Um, but it's this pervasive pattern of social and interpersonal deficits, uh, reduced capacity for close relationships and maybe some cognitive or perceptual distortions. But again, it's not a full blown schizophrenia. Okay. All right. Cluster B. Antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic. I don't know why there's a big space there. Okay, sorry. Um, antisocial are people who have no regard uh, for others' rights or society's norms. Okay, um, these are people, these are the people that might torture animals when they're kids or, um, you know, become repeat criminals and have no real regard for anybody else's rights or feelings, etc. Okay. Um, borderline personality disorder. These are people who have a severe fear of abandonment in any type of relationship. Um, they have unstable relationships, unstable, you know, not a clear self image. They can be impulsive. Um, they tend to be overwhelmed with emotions almost all the time. So they tend to get very reactive and they're always expecting people to leave them or end relationships. Okay. Histrionic people with histrionic personality disorder are basically overly dramatic. Okay. Everything is a huge, dramatic, explosive episode. Um, everything is life or death. Everything is an emergency. Um, everything is, um, uh, is potentially, you know, the, the greatest thing in the world or the worst thing in the world. Okay. People with narcissistic personality disorder have a strong need for admiration. Um, they lack empathy for others. They just need to be loved. They need to be in the spotlight all the time. And again, how do you make the diagnosis of this, right? It's a hard thing to do. Is the person uh, really, is the person really diagnosable with a disorder if they're narcissistic, if they really have excessive self-love? Or is it just somebody, again, who just is a little bit further along than, you know, what's typical or what's to be expected, okay? Again, these are hard disorders to, to, to diagnose, okay? Lastly, cluster C, uh, avoidant, uh, dependent, and obsessive compulsive. Avoidant personality disorder are people with social inhibition, uh, feelings of inadequacy or hypersensitivity to negative evaluation. So understand that this is different from schizoid personality disorder. People with schizoid personality disorder have no interest in relationships, none. They don't want them. People with avoidant personality disorder tend to be socially inhibited because they're worried that they're going to be judged badly um, or have bad evaluations by peers or others. They want the social relationships, but they fear that they're inadequate, they fear that they are subpar. They fear that in some way, if they engage in these social relationships, they'll have a bad outcome. Okay. So they want the social relationships. They are able to, they theoretically have the capacity to engage socially, but they're so afraid that they're going to experience a bad outcome that they avoid it. Okay. Dependent and codependent personality disorder are people who either have excessive need to be taken care of by somebody else 
or the excessive need to take care of others. Okay, the last one that we'll talk about to round out this lecture and, and, and this topic is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. Now, don't confuse obsessive compulsive personality disorder with obsessive compulsive disorder, and I wish that they would change the name of one of these so that it makes it more clear, it, it delineates from, from each other, okay? People with obsessive compulsive personality disorder obsess a little bit, but about everything, everything, okay? They're going to obsess about keeping their house clean. They're going to obsess about doing their job perfectly. And I use that word perfect kind of tongue in cheek, but they do say perfect all the time. Um, they obsess and compulse about being, you know, well-groomed and, and not having, um, not having wrinkles in their clothing, let's say. They obsess about their fitness, uh, about their health, about their diet, a little bit about everything. Okay. This is different from people with obsessive compulsive disorder who obsess a lot about one thing. They might obsess about contamination. They might obsess about um, negative thoughts. They might obsess about um, bad things happening to somebody else, right? And they'll obsess and it will sort of be this downward spiral where the obsession is about that one thing and it gets worse and worse and worse typically. And it becomes, you know, somewhat proverbially paralyzing where it stops their functioning or interferes with their functioning dramatically. People with obsessive compulsive personality disorder can function relatively normally in the right setting. So somebody with obsessive compulsive personality disorder, if they're acting as an accountant, they might be fantastic accountants. They have to be so careful, but they're obsessed with order and rules and rituals and routines, right? And so they have to go through this process. They have to go through, you know, step A, B, C, and D. They can't skip steps B and C to get to D, right? They have to go through every step in order. They're very meticulous. And in certain situations, this can be a benefit. In other situations, this could be a detriment. It could be very difficult. You know, if you're the CEO of a startup company and things change very quickly and you have to make decisions quickly and there's no real template for this or format for this, so you, you don't have a frame of reference, you might have a very hard time if you have obsessive compulsive disorder. It might get in the way of your functioning normally. Um, it might cause you to spend less time, you know, with your family because you're dotting every I and crossing every T at work and you're not coming home. Um, it might cause you problems in social relationships because you have such rigid rules. It might actually slow you down at work. Um, you might create these systems and these checks and balances that are unnecessarily redundant or unnecessarily rigid which then makes you work more slowly than other people, maybe more accurately, but maybe too slow to be effective or productive. Okay. And in some regards, obsessive compulsive personality disorder can be an asset. And in other regards, it might not be, it can be a detriment. Okay. All right. So I know that this was a lot of information. Uh, I'm going to end the lecture and the discussion now. Um, but, um, just remember that when we're talking about psychological disorders, you know, it's never one symptom that's going to be enough to make a diagnosis. And we're always going to have to ask ourselves the same three questions. Is it causing significant distress to the individual who's experiencing the symptom? Is it getting in the way of the individual's ability to function normally? And is it extreme? Okay, if it doesn't meet at least one of those criteria, it's not something that we're really going to consider a disorder. Okay, if it does meet one, two, or even three of those criteria, the more that it meets, the more likely that it is that we're going to diagnose a disorder. Then the next step is to figure out which disorder it is. So we go by main symptom first, which will give us a category of disorders. Then we look at each disorder within that category to see which symptoms the person is experiencing and which of those symptoms match which disorder most accurately, it's sort of like a decision tree. Okay, hope that this was clear and helpful. Feel free to go through the, the, the slides again and feel free to pause the video and go back uh, and listen again. And again, I'm always available for questions. Email me at any time, uh, david.troy at kbcc.cuny.edu. All right, thanks.